And I actually want to start by talking about a principle that is within social psychology called in groups and out groups. Another way to look at it is to say an us versus them mentality. And let me give you an example of how this works. You might be crossing the street. You know, you're out for a walk on a Saturday afternoon with your family and you come to the crosswalk, you hit the button about nine times because that's what everybody does, right? And then you walk across the street and you see, oh, I've got about 25 seconds. It's giving me a timer. I'm going to take my time and just enjoy the walk. Well, then you see, you look up ahead and somebody pulls up to the street to the, to the line and is wanting to turn right onto the street in front of you and you know they see you going real slow and they're getting frustrated they're getting really upset at you and you're thinking hey this is my right I'm the pedestrian I can do this if I want that's what we call an in-group versus an out-group because the in-group you're thinking yeah I've got every right to do this but then what happens is is when the roles are reversed we might be the driver and someone else is walking across the street taking their time and we might be late for work or some other engagement and we might get really upset at that person and forget how that we were in that situation before walk crossing the street taking our own time. It's this inability to be able to see from other people's perspectives that we start to create enemies out of people that are not in our particular groups. And so we have a hard time seeing things from other people's perspectives. And so this can have to do with political affiliations, like whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, a Libertarian, Green Party, whatever, constitutional, whatever party you might be, okay, you might start to vilify, you might, you might start to look at other parties as maybe your enemies because they think differently from you. And actually, I think this has actually gotten worse because of social media. Because here's something you can do with social media, particularly uh, Facebook. You can unfollow people without them ever knowing. It's a very passive aggressive way of like saying, I don't want anything to do with this person anymore. Rather than unfriending, you can unfollow them and you won't see their posts anymore if you disagree with them. Or you can hide things so that you don't see particular posts from other things that you don't disagree with. So you could actually to create a scenario where you only see on your Facebook feed things that you agree with. Only things that you agree with. And I don't mean all of this to say that you can't have convictions. Yes, we are Christians. We have convictions on what is true and we have to have those things. That's what we base our whole life upon. But the problem becomes when we start to do this towards other Christians. When we start to have our own mentality about, okay, this is what a Christian is supposed to be and then it's over little things. It's not over things like, the deity of Jesus or the authority of God's word or whether or on the fact that Jesus' death was a substitution on our behalf and that he atones for us our sins completely. It's not over things like that. It's over minor, smaller things that aren't as important. And so what's important for us to realize is when we act in this way and we start to create these kind of in-group, out-group kind of mentalities, we're actually breeding pride and self-centeredness. And this actually becomes really hard to defeat in our lives because we start and, and start to see from other people's perspectives because we don't listen well. We have our biases confirmed for us all the time. And not to mention how deeply rooted pride can be within the human heart because of the fact that we have a sin nature that we are born with because of the original sin, because of Adam sinning originally back in early in Genesis chapter 3. And so what we need to do is we need to see how pride gets in the way of a lot of things of what God wants to do. And we need to say, God, I want to be different. And as we'll see today, pride has no place whatsoever in the life of the church. And so the very famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis wrote about pride. This is what he had to say. It'll be on the screen. Pride is the mother hen under which all other sins are hatched. It's the very basic foundational sin. It's the sin that basically says to God, God, I know better than you what is right and what is wrong. God, I am choosing my own way rather than yours. That is what pride is. And then what we end up doing is we end up starting to elevate ourselves above not only God and what his standards are, but also above other people because we might say, you know, I'm doing this thing a whole lot better than other people. I've got this thing figured out. But you've got to understand, this is not the way of Jesus. This is not the way that a Christian needs to be acting. And I think one of the things I fear is that one of the, um, the, the source of many of the problems that we have in the church is from this. It is from an inability to be humble and to look out for one another's needs in the church. Because this self-centered pride leads to disunity and disharmony. 
And as we'll see later, this is a natural thing for us to do is to have more focus upon ourselves, upon our own pride. And so this morning, we're gonna consider four ways that humility brings about unity in the church. And here's what they all are, is that we recognize the gift of our salvation by faith, have the same mindset for mission, to not act out of selfishness or self-promotion, and consider others more important than ourselves. So now I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. If you need a brown hardcover back Bible in the seat in front of you, if you did not bring a Bible with you, go ahead and grab that. Turn to page 1179. And while you're doing that, I'm going to give you a quick little background of the book and of this letter. And Paul wrote this letter from prison while he was in Rome in the mid-60s AD. And then while uh, the city that he's writing to is this very wealthy city. They were, uh, they had large fertile lands around them. They also had large deposits of gold, silver, and copper, but it was also a very pagan city. It was devoted to the Roman imperial cult, which meant many gods that they worshiped. And so Paul visited this city and we see this recorded in Acts chapter 16 and it shows how he had to struggle against this imperial cult, how he had to kind of fight against them and how, but also he saw great success in seeing people come to Christ and people being discipled in the church growing. And so as we'll see in this, as you see in this letter, Paul has deep love for these Philippians. He cares about them very deeply, but he also had things that he wanted to tweak and he wanted to see corrected. And so his main intention in writing was to thank them for this financial gift that they had given to supply for his ministry. But we're also going to see how the church was struggling with unity and having contentiousness between each other. And so you, we need to understand that divisions like this are not just petty disagree or little minor disagreements that are not that big a deal, but these things can balloon into devastating church splits. And I've seen this in my own life of seeing churches split over things that really didn't matter all that much. And it destroys what Jesus intended for the church to be when he created it. And so a reminder, Paul is assuming that they all agree over things about the things about Jesus and his deity or the authority of the Bible or the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross on our behalf. But he's, what he's going to be addressing is these, the minor issues and having unity through those things. And so this is what we're going to focus on today, and we'll see how these apply to other relationships as well. So let's begin. Uh, what I'm going to actually have you do is we're going to stand up and we're going to read all of it together, four verses. Uh, in Ron's words, this is his way of making up for making me preach on Romans 9 through 11 in the fall. 99 verses of the most dense theological stuff you'll find in the Bible. So I get four today. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, stand up, and we will read this together. It'll be on the screen. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that speaks to us. May, it, may you be the one who is speaking this morning. And God, may we come to a place of recognizing our need to have humility and that you are God, we are not, and help us to look out for each other's needs more than our own. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You may take a seat. So we're going to go through uh, one verse at a time as we kind of piece this together. So uh, let's go ahead and look at verse one. It starts with saying, therefore, and I learned this from my Bible high school, Sunday school teacher. So remember, and I've, if you've heard me preach before, you've heard me say this likely. What is the therefore? Therefore. Okay. Nice little clever thing. So what he's doing is he's actually connecting back to something he just said at the end of chapter one, where he's talking about having unity. He is appealing to the Philippians, have unity, but he's also connecting it to the idea of their suffering. Have unity through the suffering that you are going through that I have gone through. Let have unity through those things because Christianity was not popular at this time, okay? And so Paul is encouraging them he's, and he's saying, These, this, you need to have unity. But then he goes into a very complex Greek sentence. Now, you've got to understand this about Paul. Paul is a brilliant mind. So what he does here is he 
he does what's called a first class conditional statement. I just learned about this in my Greek class. It's really fun. What it means is if this is true, and it is, it actually is true, then this is also true. Then this is what you must do with that. There are other kinds of conditional statements, but that's another lesson for another time. And what he's doing here is he's basically saying, look, these are absolutely true. So actually, sometimes translating this as if is a little soft, okay? We could actually translate this as since or because, because these are absolutely 100% true in our faith. So we could actually say, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, since there's comfort from his love, since there is com common sharing in the spirit, and since there is tenderness and compassion, that these things are absolutely 100% true. And so let's break each one of these little phrases down. This encouragement from being united with Christ. The word for encouragement here has the root meaning of coming alongside someone to give assistance by offering comfort, counsel, or exhortation. So it's this coming alongside, with, to, alongside someone. But he says if you're encouraged by this un being united with Christ, Christ. And he's talking about salvation. He's talking about becoming one with Christ. And here's what happens. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become one with him by the Holy Spirit. You are bonded with him. You are one with him now. And so he's saying, since this is a reality, that this has actually happened, that you believe in Christ, his atoning sacrifice on the cross to cover for your sins, then you have become one with him. And since you are encouraged because of this salvation in Christ, that makes you one with him. So that's his part one of this fourfold conditional statement. Part one. Part two, he says, if any comfort from his love, since there is comfort from his love. The idea of comfort here is, has the literal meaning of speaking closely with someone and with the added idea of comfort or solace. I've seen there being, uh, comforting them, letting them know that you care. But he also, when he refers to this idea of love, it comes from the comfort of knowing that the Lord grants to us us, all of us worthy sinners, unworthy sinners, a salvation, the grace of salvation that we do not deserve, that God bestowed upon us incredible love by becoming human, dying on the cross for us. And so it's that this love is bestowed on all of us. This is the way that we have comfort from it, since we have comfort from this love. But then he also says, since we have this common sharing in the spirit, he uses a word here that I really like in Greek, it's koinonia. What koinonia is, it means is like fellowship, mutual partnership, okay, mutual sharing. And it's about the fellowship, yes, that we have with God. We focus that on, on that a lot as American Christians. We focus on the individual personal relationship that we have with God. But it's also about how when we believe in Christ, we all become one together with him. So we are one as a church, as a church and around the whole world because of the fact that we are united by 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 faith through or through faith to Christ and through and to each other. So as Paul puts this in 1 Corinthians 12, he calls us that we are we are the body that we are members of one another like truly literally connected to one another. And so this unity is extremely important because when we are doing this, when we are then partnering with Jesus for his gospel, we are partnering with one another. And when we don't do this, when we don't have unity, we're not partnering with one another. We, come, we become disjointed. We're removing members from each other, from ourselves. And that's not what Jesus has designed us to be. And then he says, since there's tenderness and compassion, and these characterize the way that Jesus acted towards those of us who were weak and oppressed, and that's truly all of us, those of us who were in sin, those of us who were in need of a savior, in need of redemption. And this tenderness word comes from a word that literally refers to, this is kind of weird, so just bear with me. It, kind of, it literally refers to the bowels, okay? Meaning this is something that comes down Deep, from deep within, this emotional feeling of compassion and love for other people within your church, within the church as a whole, and that you would have compassion. Compassion means suffering with them. And so since all of these are true, these are all to be our attitudes. This is what we need to be doing. But within these four positive statements, there's kind of a negative implication here that he's kind of talking about. 
First of all, if a church does not pursue unity because of these things, it weakens the church and leaves a church in actual sin because they are not pursuing Christ. And according to John MacArthur, a pastor that I referenced a lot in in studying for this, it says, it's like you're willing to receive the blessings of the Lord, but are unwilling to offer him anything in return. And so here's our first way that we can bring about unity by humility. It's that we recognize the gift of our salvation by faith. And that by placing our faith in Christ, we become united with Christ. And doing so forces us to come to the recognition of our own sin, of our incapability of becoming right with God on our own effort. And so this will naturally lead to humility because we knew we couldn't do this ourselves. And that all of these things, the encouragement, the comfort, the common sharing, the tenderness and compassion, these are all things that cannot possibly happen just by our own effort. And that we, this, and this comes from a faith that we did not create for ourselves. And that only by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us can these things be ours. And so when we recognize that this, this salvation is truly a gift that has been given to us, not one that we, we earned on our own, it allows for us to have humility But I think what we have a tendency to do, especially for those of us who have been Christians for a long time, is that we forget that this salvation we have have received is an ongoing thing. It is always saving you. You are always being changed and that we need to remember this in a humble manner, that this is God constantly being the one to change us. And what can happen is we can slowly devolve this when we forget that this is an ongoing thing. It wasn't just one, a one time that we prayed a prayer, but how Jesus is constantly remaking us into his image. When we remember that, or when we forget that, what can we end up doing is we start to, for, we stop being humble and we start to build that in-group mentality and start to forget about the perspectives from other people. And so what we need to do is we need to constantly remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel and that this was not something that we did, but that this puts us into a humble place which, where we can humbly treat others in their sin as Christ treated us while we were in our sin. Let's continue, verse two. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So now he's going to complete. So he did that fourfold conditional statement. He talked about four, those four different things, the encouragement, the comfort, the common sharing, the tenderness and compassion. And now he's going to complete it. This is what needs to happen as a result of those four things being true. And he kind of belabors the point. He says the same thing, almost, like almost the exact same way three or four times in this part. But first he says, complete, make my joy complete. And he uses this great word in Greek called plerao. Plerao means to fill, to complete, to fill full, to fulfill. I know that sounds like saying it all in the same way four different times, but, but it makes sense. He says, and that what he likely means by saying it this way is, Fill his joy. Paul wants the Philippians to fill his joy to the fullest because he already has joy for them. He already cares for them. But now if the Philippians are united, it will bring his joy to completion because this is being what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be united. They're supposed to be together. And so the question then becomes, how can they do that? How can we do that now? And the first thing he says is by being like-minded. When he says that phrase, the Greek here literally means to have the same mindset, to be like-minded. He's not talking about, again, he's assuming that the doctrinal ideas of Jesus on the cross, the authority of his word, the identity of who Jesus is, he's assuming those are, they all agree on that already, but that now they need to have a mindset of agreeing on the same purpose, the same mission on where they are going. And they might not have, on some of the minor things, they might not have the same opinions on everything, and that's okay. But that we would have the same purpose to which we were called, to be saved, and to participate then in the mission of Jesus to save others. And not just, again, conversions where people pray to receive Christ one time in their life at some point, but then there's no change or no difference in their life, but disciples of Christ who then can make other disciples. 
And so when we are not united, I think a lot of the times it is because we are focused more on other things than what God has set in front of us and what we need to do. Or as Paul puts it in Colossians 3, that you are actually focused on earthly things rather than on heavenly things. These can be things like our political affiliations, okay? These can be ministry philosophies. These can be opinions on, you know, conscience issues about whether you can eat certain foods or drink alcohol, things like that. We can have all kinds of differing opinions on that, but we can have sometimes be more focused on the earthly things than we are on the things of God. And so then he says to have the same love. And when he uses, the word he uses here is for love is agape. You've got to understand there are actually four different words in Greek to describe love. Okay, so this is not a word for preference or attraction to someone. This is a love that is a choosing to love someone and to seek their benefit. And I think what we often have a tendency to do is rather than loving others, sometimes we get to a point where we focus on our in-groups and we view others as enemies and judge them and we put them down for not being the same way or not thinking the same way on some things. And so then rather than choosing to pursue them and show them the beautiful agape love of Christ who chose to die for us despite our sin and wickedness, and so then he says to be one in spirit. It literally means one sold, to have a selfless harmony with your fellow believers. And so what this removes is any possibility of selfish ambition or any vain conceit, as he'll talk about in the next verse, but that we will not let small differences separate us or hinder us from serving God. And then lastly, he, he ends it with saying, and of one mind. And what the, what he truly means here is intent on purpose, thinking one thing. And it's synonymous with the idea of what he said earlier about being like-minded. But what he's doing is he's bringing it full circle. He's saying this all over again. This is all encompassing. This goes uh, to every aspect of our life that we need to have this all-encompassing unity. And so this is our second way that we can build unity by humility is to have the same mindset for the mission of Jesus. Paul said elsewhere in Ephesians 4, 3, to be eager to maintain unity. And eager there, it literally means to be diligent, describing a persistent effort to maintain unity. Unity is not just something that just happens by mistake. It happens because you are pursuing it and you are making it happen. You are pursuing other people, showing them the love of Christ. And that starts by understanding what the mission and purpose of the church is. And so the mission of the church is the Great Commission. This is what Jesus gave to his disciples when he was getting ready to leave. And this is what he said at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. This is what we are to be doing as the church. It's not about however we want to form it and do it differently. It's about doing that. It's not about finding some for form of political gain in the world, whether for conservatism or liberalism. It's not about winning morality or ethical wars in culture. It's about seeing people come to a belief in Christ and be discipled to a point where they can then go and make disciples. So in every aspect of our life as a church, we need to be in one mindset, in one love that chooses to act for the benefit of others, to live in selfless harmony so that the world will know that what we preach is more than just subjective, mystical ideas. Because we need to remember a couple things that Jesus said that relates to this. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's how people will know if this is true, is if we love one another, if we are choosing to seek the benefit of others, if we love one another. But Jesus also said this. He was talking about in John 17 where he's praying and he says, and may the church be one and they may be one with me and you, God. And, and then he says this, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This unity is what is an evidence to the world that Jesus is who he said he is. This is why unity is so important. This is why we do what we do. And we need to make sure that we understand the same mindset, the same purpose for the mission of Jesus. Let's continue. The first part of verse three. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And so how is this same-minded unity achieved? First of all, by not doing anything out of our own selfishness. The selfishness he mentions here is not to have any part of the church whatsoever. It descri- the selfishness describes a person who persistently seeks personal advantage and gain regardless of the effect on others pushes other people's down and other people down. And this might not surprise you, but this word is actually referred to kind of a stereotype we might have in our culture. But this is actually have, has been used of for politicians back in the day, okay? There are good politicians. There are very good ones out there. But how some in that day would be self-preserving, pushing down other people for their own benefit, and so it gives us this idea of building oneself, by, oneself up by tearing someone else down. And this is what we do when we judge others, when we put them down in our own minds or we lack tenderness and compassion. And then he says the, the vain conceit, and I love this. It literally means empty glory. On one hand, selfish ambition is about the pursuit of personal goals, but vain conceit seeks personal glory and acclaim. And empty glory is an overinflated self-image. This idea that you are greater than you actually are. And this person is absolutely incapable of unity with others because everything is completely centered on them. It's hubris. It's believing oneself to be more important than they actually are. And these are things that have, are to have no part of the church whatsoever. And so this is our third way to have un- unity by humility is to not act out of selfishness or self-promotion. And just because you can't necessarily put yourself in one of the extremes mentioned here, you still need to consider how you have acted selfishly and, and with empty conceit. Think about all the times in all of your relationships. Have you ever acted selfishly in your marriage? I have, okay, I'm, I'm a human being. Have you done that at work? Have you done that in a dating relationship? Have you done that with your friends? Have you done that with your kids? Have you done that with other family members? All of these relationships apply. You have acted selfishly at some point in your life because you're a human being. We all have. But in these relationships, we've also likely tried to create a self-image that was exaggerated, that was not based in any form of reality, and we've tried to self-promote, try to put ourselves up. But here's the reality. When we do this within the walls of the church, we destroy what Christ created the church to be because we start to fight over minor issues because we think we know better than anybody else that this is the most important thing. Or we judge others in our midst who really just need tenderness and compassion and love. And so we hinder the mission and no longer function as the church of Christ. And so I just encourage you, if you have had disagreements with other people or if you've acted selfishly or exaggerated your own identity with people, just take a moment this morning and to say, God, I, I need to change. I need, God, I, I, I recognize that this is wrong. I have done wrong, Jesus. Would you please forgive me and help me change? Because it is only by his grace that we can act any differently than we have been currently acting. It's only by his grace. And the hope and the beauty of the gospel is that not only, only is it only by his grace that he can do it, but he will do it when we come to him humbly and asking him to work in our lives. Okay, let's move on to our last phrase for this morning. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So instead, Christians are to be humble. And this is the exact opposite of this selfish ambition and this empty glory. And the Greek here for humble, it means lowliness of mind. It's commonly used for a slave or someone who had little value. And it's not like you're supposed to sit there and go, well... I guess I don't really matter all that much. I'm not that important. I'm not that special. There's a balance there. We need to recognize our place before God, but it's also not this false modesty where someone says something like, oh, you know, you do something great and you look at them and you go, ah, I'm re- I, that really wasn't that good. That wasn't that great. Or you might say, Oh, no, it was, actually, it was actually all God. God did all of that. Instead of recognizing that God has given you the gifts to use for his kingdom, and you can say, yeah, God did that. That was awesome. Thanks, God, for that gift that you gave me. I, 
you used me in a special way. But Jesus mentions humility in a couple different ways in the Sermon on the Mount, which is his most famous sermon in Matthew chapter five. This is what in what's called the Beatitudes section. This is what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. But he also says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And this goes totally against the way that we think in our world. We think that those who are not poor in spirit, those who have are, are rich in talent and skill and can climb the ladder and can look really great, if they do all these righteous good things, then God must be pleased with them. Or we might think about the meek. We, you know, Jesus says, blessed are the meek. We think of the opposite. Those who are powerful and strong, that those who are climbing the ladder and, and pushing other people down, those are the people who are going to get the earth because look how strong they are. But Jesus says, no, it's the, those who are poor in spirit who say, God, I've got nothing. I've got nothing that I can offer you of my own righteousness because I am a sinner in need of grace. Jesus says, those are the people who are gonna see God because they recognize their need for him. But also the ones who will inherit the earth are the ones who say, I'm powerless. I've got, I've got no abilities on my own here. I need Jesus. Blessed are the meek. These are the, the, the attitudes. And so humility is about recognizing our lowliness before a perfect and holy God, how we cannot make ourselves righteous before him. But it's also recognizing as well that we are no better or no worse in terms of our place before God than any other person. Yes, there are people who have done horrible, wicked, awful things in our world, but because each and every one of us falls short of the glory of God, we stand before God as equals, all people needing the redemption of Jesus. And so what he's talking about here is that we are to then, through, with true love and humility, value others above ourselves. And MacArthur has this to say about this phrase, because I think we, we have a tendency to twist this a little bit. He says, it does not mean to pretend that others are more important, but to believe that others actually are more important. Because we have a tendency to do this. It's like, okay, we need to treat people as if they are more important, which actually implies that they still really aren't. You're just treating them as if they are. But what Paul is talking about here, that we actually need to be convinced in our minds that others' values and needs are more important than our own. What other people need is more important than my own. And if everybody, everybody in the church did that, I just want us to take a moment to imagine what that would be like if everyone actually did that, to consider others more important than themselves. And that to not look to your own interests. It means to observe something for special consideration. Not self-promoting, not pursuing your own interests, but rather considering others' needs as more important than yourself. And ultimately, this is the idea that connects everything from these four verses. If it's true that being united with Christ has been encouraging and you've been comforted by his love and you are able to share together in the Holy Spirit through being united to Christ, and if you have tenderness and compassion, and he says, then be united and show that, it is at, that you are actually united by truly believing that others are more important than yourself and acting upon it. And Paul says that in Galatians 6, 2, that when you do that, this is what actually helps you fulfill the law of Christ because you show people respect, dignity, love, kindness, tenderness, compassion. And we got to keep this in mind. We do this because Christ did this for us. And so this is our fourth way that we need to have unity by humility is that we consider others as more important than ourselves. Keep in mind that what Paul is talking about here goes completely against everything human beings are, and it is impossible to achieve on our own effort. And in other words, you cannot simply grit your teeth and get good at this. You need the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit powerfully working within you to change you, to make you into a new person. And only by his power can you then live in a humble manner. And I've actually come to believe that the Christian life is a constant recognition of our selfishness and our need to move past our selfishness into humility because to be humble means to recognize that it was our sin was what caused the separation between us and God. 
and that it is nobody else's fault but our own, but that God loved us enough to come and die on our behalf, to forgive us of our sins, to make us right with him again, and to enable us to become more like Christ. But we also need to remember that it is far too easy and more natural to tend towards considering your needs as more important because that's our human nature. That's what we do. But we need to remember that this is not the way of Jesus. I saw a famous quote this week uh, from someone that I couldn't find who it was from. I read it in one of the books I was reading, looked it up on the internet, could not find who it was from. So if you know, let me know after the service. But this is what it says. Love begins when someone else's needs are more important than my own. So as we've seen today, if we want to have unity with the church and within our relationships, then we must understand love in this sense. As Paul stated, others' needs are more important than our own. In our marriages, we need to see that our spouse's needs are more important than our own. We need to consider it that way as truth. I also fully believe that if marriages, if all people who are in marriage relationships right now believe this, our divorce rate would plummet because a lot of the issues stem from that, not seeing their spouse's needs as more important than their own. But in our friendships, think of how you could serve and love others in your midst that do not know Jesus, to show them a humility that is completely foreign to this world, how that might change their perspective. Or in a dating relationship, you might be single looking for someone that you might want to marry someday. And, you, and I think the funny thing is about dating and marriage is that many people truly want someone who acts in a selfless way, but then don't seek to become that kind of person themselves. That's the important thing. Become that person and you might just find someone else like that as well. But also think about how you could do this with your kids, with other family members. But we need to remember what we learned from the whole morning is that we need to recognize the gift of our salvation by faith, have the same mindset for mission, to not act out of selfishness or self-promotion and consider others more important than ourselves. And so that by recognizing our true place as sinners redeemed by God, we can then act in humility towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, considering them as more important than ourselves and thus bringing unity into our midst. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We love you. God, we pray that we would be people who would be humble, who would recognize our need for you. God, that we cannot bring about our own righteousness, but only you can do it. And so Jesus, we thank you for who you are, your great love for us. God, may we live in humility towards one another and seek to build humility. We pray this in your name, amen.